In part one, when we were looking at Alistair McIntyre's virtue theory, we laid the foundation of talking about practices because McIntyre says you really can't understand virtues unless you understand the context, the foundations in practices. Now in part two, we can go on and talk about the virtues much more carefully. So we've laid out the concept of what a, what a practice is. And we've said that the achievement of the internal goods, the goods that are internal to the individual and internal to the practice is a good for the whole community who participate in the practice. So for example, Michael Jordan's excellences in basketball enriched everyone who plays after him. And of course, you could go prior to him to Dr. J or prior to him to Connie Hawkins and so on. And then obviously after him to LeBron and, and Kobe and Stephon Curry and et cetera, whoever's playing now uh, as you hear this. So that's share, those are shared goods that can be passed on and expanded. So consider a child who is learning chess. Now, initially, the child might be motivated by external goods. So you provide some rewards for the child to learn chess. But then the internal goods themselves, the acquisition of the analytical reasoning that's involved in playing chess, the creativity, the competitive intensity, these are all inherent to playing chess well, and a child develops those that are important. And if the motivation as the child learns to play chess more effectively and it becomes better and better at the game, if the motivation really remains external for just trophies or fame or something like that, right? That's not exactly the normal approach to fame, but certainly you can become a famous chess player within the realm of chess. So if that remains external, then that child is going to have no reason not to cheat, right? It, whatever it takes to get the external good. Uh, obviously, though, that's, that's not developing virtue. If the child develops a motivation for internal goods, the ones we just mentioned and are on your screen still, then cheating is only going to harm himself or herself, right? Cheating isn't going to help develop the analytical reasoning, the creativity, and the competitive intensity that are mentioned there. Okay, so ethics is a practice, according to McIntyre. That's why we spend so much time talking about practices. Ethics itself is a practice with internal goods. And the internal goods for ethics then are virtues. And one has to accept one's own incapacity to judge correctly, just like with other practices as you enter into the practice. And you have to comply with standards, with rules, with guidelines. So even though obviously virtues are the important way of thinking about the moral theory of McIntyre, you have to have guidelines in order to enter into virtues. Now, this is true with Aristotle as well. So because of this, since there are these standards and you have to comply with the standards, McIntyre rules out subjectivist approaches to ethics or emotivist analyses of, of ethics. Those are, don't fit with a virtue theory as, as McIntyre develops them, right? That you can't just simply shoot a certain way because it feels good when you're playing basketball. You can't just do things because a certain group decides that's the way to do them. There are standards within the practice. Okay, so now what is a virtue? Well, we do have a quote here from McIntyre to look at. Virtue is an acquired human quality, the possession and exercise of which tends to enable us to achieve those goods which are internal to practices and the lack of which effectively prevents us from achieving any such goods. So you can talk about virtues in the context of playing chess or doing science. 
But of course, in the context of ethics, we're going to have the traditional virtues that you might think of. And without virtues, then we're unable to have the goods that are internal to the practices. If you don't develop the virtues, you don't acquire the internal goods. And this is why we can say with McIntyre that virtue is its own reward. That's the important thing that you want to develop. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about the relationship now between virtues and external goods. Virtues might sometimes inhibit the acquisition of, of external goods. So for example, honesty at times might prevent or inhibit the gain of power or fame or wealth. One who is honest may uh, put a hindrance to acquiring those external goods. Um, so in a society, when you value external goods supremely, fame, wealth, power, for example, that society will, will inevitably be a society that lacks virtue. People won't be virtuous because that's not what is important. So the role of the virtues won't be what it ought to be. Now, we should add this clarification. This is not to say that external goods are not goods at all. In fact, some virtues require external goods and generosity, for example, justice, for example. A generosity requires some wealth. Justice requires some power in order to have those as virtues. Well, let's take a closer look at some of those individual virtues. We've mentioned all three of these now, justice, courage, honesty. Maybe I haven't mentioned courage, but uh, that's a traditional virtue, clearly. These are essential aspects of McIntyre's concept of a practice when we're talking about ethics. So consider justice. We have to learn to recognize what is due to whom. So that's, you know, the traditional baseline starting point for ethical theory when you're talking about justice. And courage. So we have to be prepared to take whatever self-endangering risks are demanded. So courage does involve risk. It always does, this potential for harm. And honesty. So that means we have to listen carefully, at least initially, right? This is just in a starting point for honesty. We have to listen carefully to what we are told about our own inadequacies. We have to accept the authorities, right? The guidelines for the virtues. And we have to reply with the same carefulness to the facts. We can't uh, manipulate the facts, try to change, switch them around. And not accepting virtues is obviously going to be problematic. To not accept the virtues that is uh, say for a child to be willing to cheat uh, in learning chess, right? That's going to bar us from achieving the standards of excellence. So that's going to render the practice pointless, except as a device for achieving external goods. If you throw out the virtues, the internal goods related to the practice, the practice suffers itself. It's just going to be this pointless activity, whatever it is that helps you gain external goods. But the virtues are those goods by which reference to which, whether we like it or not, we define our relationships with the other people with whom we share the same kinds of purposes and standards which inform practices. So this is true right within, a, within any of the practices that we've mentioned, so science, sports, games, and of course, it's true in ethics. The virtues uh, as traditionally conceived, right? Uh, courage and justice and honesty, as McIntyre emphasizes, those are going to tell us how we interact with other people. It'll, it'll define our relationships. So let's talk about that a little bit more, right? You have those three primary virtues, justice, courage, honesty. And for McIntyre, those form a common core for any virtue theory. Any successful virtue theory is going to emphasize those virtues. And reference to the virtues has to be made 
in certain kinds of human relationships. That this is why I, I think uh, McIntyre would agree that Aristotle talked about politics and he said, you can't do ethics without politics. Now his definition of politics was different than what you might think today, right? It's just developing a, a community and how one relates to everyone else within that community. So if one is honest with one friend, for example, but not to a different friend, then you have different relationships, right? That's going to be part of how you define your relationship with that person. Now, McIntyre considers and, and looks carefully at Benjamin Franklin kind of as a virtue theory. Now, Franklin emphasizes virtues first and foremost. That's what he talks about. But his list of virtues is different from what we're talking about, from what McIntyre's talking about, because it's utilitarian. The baseline idea behind Franklin's virtues is to acquire happiness and, and to allow happiness to uh, be spread to other people. The, the T loss, the external good, then is playing a central role. So technically, Franklin's theory with uh, timeliness and cleanliness and, and silence, those kinds of virtues, it's not truly a virtue theory. It's, a, it's not truly an eretaic theory. And notice though, so even though we may start with virtues and talking about virtues with Franklin, his really is a utilitarian theory. Whereas with McIntyre, we start with practices before we get to the virtues. Whereas with Aristotle, similarly, we, we talk about happiness and the telos for human beings before we get to the particular virtues. So let's go beyond practices a little bit. McIntyre says this isn't going to make sense unless you go beyond the practices that he's talked about. So his view, the other traditions that he considers, he considers Jane Austen as a virtue theorist. Uh, even though clearly not a philosopher, he finds uh, virtues developed within Austen's writings that are very important. And so the other traditions he considers are inconsistent with this utilitarian view like Franklin's, and obviously McIntyre's view is inconsistent with utilitarianism. For Aristotle, you have a telos. The telos is constituted by practicing the virtues, right? So the virtues are not used in order to acquire something else. They constitute a good life for Aristotle. And that's the same then for McIntyre, right? But McIntyre's theory of virtues, he says himself, needs to be extended beyond practices. You can't just stop there. What else do you need? If you don't extend the ideas of the virtues beyond practices themselves, then they're going to be a potential. There are going to be these potentials for conflict. So uh, Gauguin, when he was focusing on his art career and he moves to the South Pacific, he leaves his family behind. And so you have this virtue of being a person of integrity who's going to follow through on their commitments, which he had made to his family, or he you know, had this commitment to his art that he was pursuing. And that's obviously a conflict it was for him. And so you need something to provide the telos, the, the overarching idea of what the good life is. That has to be there. And this is where the virtue of constancy or integrity is, is so important. This is why Gauguin seems to lack integrity when he leaves his family at a time when him leaving his family meant that they were in a very, very challenging situation. And so you have to have this overriding purpose of human life that provides coherence to the virtues. Now, we're going to have to stop here, but for McIntyre, we can just say this fairly succinctly, he is a traditional Roman Catholic. And so the overall coherence for the virtues is similar to what Aquinas says, ultimately, and it's going to have the idea of 
glorifying God and being a godly person. So that's going to be the guide for the telos that provides the theme for the good life and the virtues that McIntyre talks about. Now, you can talk about the virtues without that particular telos, but there has to be a telos. 